was Hawks last night. What's that? Was Hawks last night. Hot cherry. I'm going to go through it. Good evening, everyone. We're going to get started, so if everyone can have a seat, uh, maybe check your telephones to make sure they're on silence or do not disturb, so that during our presentation tonight, our speaker can um, give a presentation. So I want to uh, kind of go through our upcoming events. Uh, these are rotating through, so I'll kind of speak quickly, but this Thursday, Dr. Henry Shapiro, let's go back. Dr. Henry Shapiro is from uh, Jerusalem. He teaches at uh, Hebrew University, and he's also at the Van Leer Institute. But he has written a book on his dissertation, which is The Rise of the Western Armenian Diaspora in the Early Modern Ottoman Empire. That's 17th, 18th century Ottoman Empire, and how the Armenians came in large numbers to Constantinople. So by the beginning of the 20th century, there were more Armenians in Constantinople, Istanbul, than there were Turks. More Greeks and Armenians than there were Turks. What's the process? Why did they come? What did they do when they were in uh, Turkey? That's what he's going to be talking about. That's uh, 7 o'clock this Thursday in our same hall. Then we have a special presentation by an internationally renowned photographer, Perar Hak Khacherian. He's from Montreal, Canada. Perar Hak Khacherian is the author of multiple books, uh, photography books. He has been all over Artsakh, Armenia, and photographing people, churches, cities, places. Uh, it, it's a really outstanding visual picture of Armenia, but he'll also tell you the history. He's done this over the past uh, 20 years. Really an uh, extraordinary person. You'll like him. Very personable, very interesting. Friday, February the 3rd. On Friday nights, you don't need a parking pass, so just come on in on Fridays because uh, there is no uh, watching over the uh, parking permits. It's called Artsakh, the Photographer's Eye. This is a photo of the cover of the book, and that's Hawk up there. Um, again, he's an unusually interesting speaker, so please come out for that. And then on uh, Friday, February the 17th, we have a, a novelist uh, coming, Jerry Berger, who has written a book about the story of the Armenians after the genocide in which uh, he's going to talk about, the book talks about the Armenians in Fresno. It's a book about Armenians in Fresno, but as it relates to the genocide. Jerry Berger is a professor of psychology uh, on the, in California, and that talk is going to be co-sponsored by the uh, Armenian Museum of Fresno. The previous talk was co-sponsored by the Armenian General Benevolent Union, so we're co-sponsoring with different organizations. And it's a, it, it'll be a book presentation, a book, uh, first time book presentation for our community. And uh, introducing him will be Dr. Robert Bartabedian, who is the President Emeritus of Western St. Louis University. Uh, he's an Armenian from Fresno. They grew up as neighbors in Fresno. And he's coming uh, to introduce his friend and the book. So really an interesting novel about the Armenians. And then our final uh, event of February will be uh, a book talk by Dr. Dennis Papazian. Uh, really, it's a memoir. This book was published by the Armenian Studies Program Armenian Series. It's our 16th book in our series that we've published, and it, it covers his lifetime, which spans the Armenian-American experience in the United States. So Dennis Papazian was actually born in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, he was born there because his father came as an immigrant from Armenia. Uh, he became a professor and the head of the Armenian Research Center at the University, University of Michigan at Dearborn. But he's been active in almost every Armenian organization in his lifetime. He's now 90 plus years old. Uh, he'll be here with his wife, Dr. Mary Papazian. Dr. Mary Papazian uh, is President Emeritus of San Jose State University and uh, a scholar in her own right, an English scholar, close friend of mine from our UCLA days uh, back back when. Uh, so all of these are coming up. This is Thursday, February the 23rd. And just today, I also uh, heard back from another speaker. We're going to have Dr. Taner Akjam coming on Friday, uh, Friday, March the 3rd. Taner Akjam is one of the foremost uh, scholars in the Armenian G 
genocide, and he is a professor and now head of the Armenian Genocide Institute as part of the Promise Institute at UCLA. The Promise Institute was established through a $20 million uh, donation from the estate of Kirk Krikorian. Uh, this is part of the money that's being used at UCLA to do quite a few things in Armenian studies. Some of you uh, also have shared, and I want to share with you some exciting news for our program, that today we announced that uh, the Ralph Shapazian estate, uh, Ralph Shapazian was from Turlock, he's passed away, but his estate has left $700,000 to the Armenian Studies program for scholarships and for our program. So we're very grateful and there'll be announcements about this. And actually at our banquet, uh, which is on March the 26th, we are going to be honoring his family. Uh, some of you also know that recently the Humparsum family, that is Elaine Humparsum, donated $1 million to the Armenian Community School here in Fresno. What you don't know is that uh, she also donated $450,000 to the Armenian Studies Program for the benefit, again, of our program. So two really big uh, donations have come in. And that's thanks to the, the commitment and the involvement of our community, which we're always thankful because it, uh, our program reflects our community. So the pride that you have is reflected back to our university, to our president, uh, Dr. Sal Jimenez Sandoval, to our provost, Dr. Fu, to our uh, dean, Dr. Honora Chapman, and to our associate dean, I want to recognize our associate dean, uh, <laughs> Dr. Sergio Laporte is in the back over there, Dr. Sergio Laporte. Some of you may know that he was, uh, for years, the Eigen Isabel Barbarian Professor of Armenian Studies. He still is, and, uh, but he has just been appointed as the permanent associate dean in our college. So we have really uh, a really nice set of administrators who are working with our program to, to really bring you a lot of things in a lot of uh, ways. So tonight I'd like to uh, introduce our, our, our guest. Uh, but first, I'd like to introduce a couple of uh, people in the audience. I don't usually do that, but tonight is kind of a special night. I'd like to recognize the pastor of uh, Holy Trinity Armenian Church, Very Reverend Father Ashok Tachadurian. Welcome to... I'd like to recognize our honorary consul to the of the Republic of Armenia to Fresno, Mr. Ber Jabkarian and Arthur Jabkarian. Ber, thank you. And tonight, uh, we're going to have the the inaugural book launch of this book on, on Sovomon Tellurian. And it's appropriate that Fresno, of course, is the, is the place where Sovomon Tellurian was buried. And tonight with us we have Rafi, uh, Rafi Chekhardimian, who is the chairman of the Armenian Revolutionary Federation, Sovomon Tellurian Gomide. Rafi, thank you for coming out tonight as well. So, the book, uh, the book that we're going to be discussing today is called uh, Remembrances, the Assassination of Talat Pasha. It's the story that Sovomon Tillerian told to Minas, let me get the name right here because I put it over here. He told it to Minas, what's the name? Varam Minahorian. I was going to show you it and I was reading it and I didn't write it down here. So this is the first English translation of Tillerian's memoir, which was originally published in Armenian by Husaper, which is a newspaper in and a public publication house in Cairo. So it's going to be the story, the backstory of Sovomon Tillerian uh, as well. And tonight, I have my special privilege to introduce our guest speaker who has been a frequent visitor to Fresno, Fresno State, uh, Ara Sarafian. He's an archival historian. He's the executive director of the Gomidas Institute in London. He specializes in late Ottoman and modern Armenian history, uh, including the genocide, but over the past 18 years, he's got a lot of initiatives that he's going to talk about tonight as well, as well as talking about uh, the book. And he does a lot more than that. But uh, with that, I'd like to introduce and welcome Ara Sarafian. Ara?
Well, thank, thank you very much. As Barlow said, I'm a frequent visitor here. Um, it's always a pleasure to come to Fresno. I'm sort of surprised at myself because all these years I've been driving here, I never stopped at <coughs> the Army Cemetery where I saw my Martellin and his berry. Um, today I did so and I actually left a, a copy of his memoir in English on his grave. It's symbolic, but it's, it's important. So maybe one of you might go and pick it up one day. But, uh, <coughs> If you do, just I just hope you read it. <coughs> um, my presentation today is going to be sort of reverse order than normal. I'm going to talk about the book first and its content, uh, and then I'll talk about the, how I followed it, how I value, uh, uh, validated it in, in my, to my own satisfaction as a serious, uh, a serious memoir. Um, that's exactly what I think it is. I think it's, it's a book. It's a remarkable book as a literary achievement, as well as sort of factual storytelling. So that's, those are the two critical um, qualities, oh, okay. qualities of, of, of the work. <coughs> well, Solomon Tehli, as you may know, was, uh, was born in a village of Pakaric, uh, Bari Pakaric, in Kemak, near Yersinga. It's a mountainous region. I, had, I actually went there in September. It's a beautiful place. It's a, it's a huge village even today. It was predominantly Armenian. But his family, and he was born in 1896. He's, he's, he then, as you can see, very relatively well to be family. His father became a coffee merchant in Valjevo in, in Serbia, um, which is how he survived genocide. Solomon's family then moved to Yerzinga, and in 1913, Solomon went to, to Valjevo to prepare to go to German University as an engineering student, a very innocuous beginning. <clears throat> when World War Two, World War One broke out in 1914, Solomon was trapped in Serbia. He couldn't go back, and um, he decided to volunteer to fight on the Caucasus Front against the Turks. So he actually went to against his father's wishes to the Caucasus. Much of this information is not readily known because. When Solomon Talili was put on trial after Tzadkala Pasha's assassination, he lied about what he was doing in 1914-1915. So a lot of people think that he was an eyewitness to the Armenian genocide because that's the, that's the evidence he gave at his trial for obvious reasons. We'll go into that later. But in fact, Solomon had a, as we say, he had an identity, a, a, a strong Armenian identity. He and his, old bro and his brothers, they both volunteered to fight against the Turks, so I put it crudely, and uh, he went there as a young man, uh, first to Tiflis, where he was trained, basic training, and then he ended up in, as a, in, a, in a battalion of um, Antrani, General Antrani, and under the command of General uh, Sebu Zoravar, two very well-known names. Sebu Zoravar is particularly interesting because he, he also became uh, involved with, with Operation Nemesis af afterwards, uh, and assassinated Turkish leaders. <coughs> And uh, this sort of narrative event is important because it, add, add, it, it uh, addresses very, the, one of the first questions. Why did Solomon Tehlirian want to kill Talat Pasha? And the narrative is that as he went to join forces and fought against the Turks during World War I, he became an eyewitness to the Armenian genocide. Um, these are some pictures of Solomon serving as an officer. 1915 as well, so Oman is to the, to, the, uh, to your right. And this is a graphic representation in the book as well, um, because Solomon had three sort of tours, if you will, uh, against the Ottoman Turks. The first one is the bottom, when he fought from, uh, from Iran, they, he fought all the way to Van with General Antony, and that's when he, he described the first massacres that he saw. And he gives some vivid examples. He doesn't dwell on them because the book is, has been written like a novel. He could have written a lot more about the atrocities that he saw, but he gives enough information and specific cases of the atrocities that he saw. He fought with the army volunteers all the way to Van. And then when the Russians retreated suddenly in the summer of 1915, completely unexpected, he retreated with them 
to the Russian Empire one, once more, where now he became in contact with um, other eyewitnesses to the massacres. Until that point, he was under the impression, or probably under the impression, that what he had witnessed was something local in the one area. But in, in, uh, when he returned back to the Caucasus, he worked with refugees one more. So he, he sort of gives a narrative of working with refugee children, what he saw, what they told about other massacres elsewhere, how he read about um, massacres in the Carpet, for example, and in other parts of the Ottoman Empire. He, uh, he gives the example of um, Dr. Toroyan. Dr. Toroyan was actually one of the first witnesses to escape from the Ottoman Empire. He was an officer in the Turkish army. He escaped to Iran. And he also turned with the Germans as well. He escaped to Iran and he gave one of the first affidavits, first statements, I mean, book length the descriptions of what had been going on in the empire. It's important because of its timing. Zabel Yassin wrote down his account. It was serialized in the book form. And you realize how Armenians were finding out about the Armenian genocide as it was taking place. They didn't really fully appreciate the systematic nature of his killings. And so on when Telian was part of that process, he was also seeing victims and children and uh, an actual massacre site. At the end of 1915, the Russians uh, went, okay, in 1915, the Russian Solomon went to the second foray, and he um, up to Arjesh. Here, he says very little about this particular um, um, foray into, in, into the Ottoman Empire, but we know he was there because he got typhoon, and he had to leave once more to recuperate in in in, in, in Tbilisi. And then in 1916, the Russians unexpectedly occupied Erzurum. Nobody expected it. And so Owen ended up going to Erzurum, working with army refugees. And so his narrative is giving an account as the unfolding of the army genocide, as he's seeing it, reading about it. And some of the most disturbing accounts are from Erzurum, as he describes army children who had survived the massacres, living in, in old buildings, fending for themselves like animals, as he says, like animals. And so the tension in the book builds up. And while in his Erzurum, Solomon introduces one of the salient facts of his own experience, which is that as he witnessed these events, he, be, he had epileptic fits. He passed out. And <clears throat> he gives a particularly, particularly disturbing account. The first disturbing account he, uh, he gives is when he, he goes with a journalist friend of his, and he listens to a woman who sees a massacre in Jevisley near the Black Sea. Uh, Black Sea coastline, and and he, he gives a bit of an account about the, the systematic murder of children. The men are already being got, got rid of, and then the, the, the murder of women, and and then he, he describes how he passed pa, pa, uh, passed passed out. And of course, he passes out also because he's got his own family in Yersinga. For the most part, they're living. He had no idea what's going on, but he's already figuring out that they're they are probably not alive anymore. And when the Russians captured Gerzinga, he gives again an account of the massacre, the total destruction of the army in Gerzinga. Gerzinga was probably one of the worst places to be. They could not escape, and they, were, they, they didn't only even make it to their zone. They were killed south of the city, and they came up porch. There are very few Gerzinga survivors of the army genocide, and of 85 members of his family, only one of them he could find, a young girl who had, was kept by, by Kurdish men. And, 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 and released when the Russians got, got, got there. And here is when he, the most disturbing account that Tel Young gives is, and it's a very, again, it's a, it's a fantastic literary genre because you're reading the account and you don't realize that he's actually beginning to describe how he's hallucinating. He's describing his, his fit he has in the garden of his, of, of his family. Some of these heads are talking, and you, and you read them, you notice that his, he sees his mother's head, his brother's head. And they're asking you, where were you? Where were you? And so you, you sort of have this disturbing moment that he had. And this is the sort of literary genre, literary, um, brilliance of conveying all that, all that information in a way that it really shakes you, as it should, because we are talking about mass murder and, 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 and atrocities. And this is how you get to know Solomon Lilian as a victim of the army genocide by witnessing and by seeing the destruction, by seeing his physical reaction to that, 
uh, how, how he himself is changing. And gradually, this idea of killing Galat Pasha becomes an obsession. So he, in the end, he gives a very good account of, but he's, sorry, this is a, Solomon, in his own right, gives a very good account of how the Armenians tried to hang on to Yerzinga. So he, he stayed there once he realized his family was, was killed because the Armenians took over control of that region. The Russians retreated by 1917, Russian Revolution, and he gives a very vivid account from a purely historical uh, perspective of how Armenians tried to survive, hang on to those territories, and in the end they had to retreat. And he gives a long-winded uh, explanation of how they retreated back to the Caucasus. So historically this is very interesting because he gives a very vivid account of the actual battle scenes and a systematic method how, how the armies fought their way out of this region against the, the Turkish nationalist forces, the local Kurdish forces, first to Amijan and then to um, Erzurum and then to the Caucasus. In the Caucasus, after Erzurum, he was, he was actually wounded, Tehlirian, and he was taken to the Caucasus one more time. And this, this is a sort of the first part of the book, his motivation. So Oman su survives in the North Caucasus, and when the war comes to the end, to an end, and the Turks have actually surrendered, or there's an armistice, so Oman goes to, to, to Constantinople, looking for Talat Pasha, and looking for members of his family who might have survived, he puts ads in the newspaper, and while in Constantinople, he makes contact with local armies, and he's a very interesting person, by, by the name of uh, Danielian, about whom we know next to nothing. I'm, I'm sort of hoping that she came to Fresno and Marla might know about her, but I don't think that's the case. But she's a young Armenian female revolutionary, which you don't really get as a character. They become friends, and effectively, they, they plot the, the murder uh, of an Armenian um, tabajan, traitor, an Armenian collaborating with the young Turks. And this is the first time Solomon Tehlirian admits that he actually has his own audience. No, he actually shot dead the Armenian Tabajan, the Armenian traitor called uh, Artin, Artin Bergerlichan. And so the book is remarkably honest and he, in, in, in that regard. But, but of course, he, he can't find Talat, the, the Talat Pasha because he's not there, he's fled. So the story unravels, he goes to Paris, he tries to get some support to, to find Talat Pasha. And Tormon Telian fails. He, he's lost, he's bankrupt, he ends up working in, in, in Paris, and you would think that that's the end of his narrative. And then there's something extraordinary happens, there is an exhumation, I'd say. This is where Solomon's reputation, through Daniel Yan, filters to the air, the Tashna in, um, in high at Hyrenic, actually, in, in, in Boston, Watertown, Boston, because, and then Tashna Tsuchun approaches him. The ARF recruited Solomon Tehlirian for his own purposes. And, that, and, and then you have the final pursuit. Solomon goes to, goes to um, comes to the United States, goes to his brief by Armin Garo, and he's taken into what came to be known as Operation Nemesis. And this is the first insights that we have into Operation Nemesis as far as Tala Pasha's um, assassination goes, because the Arab itself has never come clean. It's never released its own records, but as we'll find out later, they did so through Solomon Tehlirian. In fact, Solomon Tehlirian's memoirs was published by the ARF. It is a semi-official text of the ARF. It was edited, as we'll come to it later. And Solomon goes back. He works with a particular, this particular group of uh, Armenian activists in Berlin. They identify Talat Pasha. It's about the, about the assassination. I, I will go into the gore of it. It's not very gory. Very well written. A very detailed and fascinating account, how they found him, and how he was entrusted with a pistol to shoot him dead. And the last part of the book is about the trial, um, primarily based on his trial transcripts, and, and of course, as you may know, he was, he was released 
on, on grounds of supposed insanity. There was a, a technicality that they adopted. Obviously, the Germans did not want the trial to go forward. It only took two days, an emergent trial. But it was obviously politicized. He doesn't re reflect on the politics of the trial because it's his memoir. It's what he knows about the case and not what we know today from police records and other sources. Now, when I got this, this, this work and I was approached by Pedro and said, would you be interested in, 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 in publishing it? I had to ask myself, how much of Talidian's story is, if put it very crudely, ARF propaganda? It's their story. It's about how great, how successful they were in assassinating a Turkish leader. I had to ask that question, and to my satisfaction, before I said, well, let's go and publish it. And the answer is that there are some critical um, resources which we can use to validate Solomon's telling and account. In fact, the account is Solomon's attempt to come clean on this issue, to give a final account of what we had done. The most important source today we have is um, the correspondence between Solomon Telidian and his editors. So, Solomon wrote his account in 1942-43 in Serbia while he was under Nazi German occupation. Again, very bizarre backing, right? It was written by three Armenians. One is being Minakorian, Baham Minakorian, who actually wrote the account, and another gentleman called Ash. Arshalus Asfazaduria. It's important because both of these uh, um, gentlemen, but Minakhori and Daimon, we have several sources describing how the book was written. And according to, to the reliable information, the book was written by committee by three of them, where Solomon narrated what had happened to him. And Minakhori, who was a brilliant, not only brilliant writer, he was a genocide survivor himself. And as Arshavis uh, Asfadadurian says, only another genocide survivor was a good writer could have written a book such as this. So they, 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 they work in, in unison, where Solomon gave the, the information and, and the Minakoyan wrote the account. When it came to editing the work, the, the editors asked all kinds of questions. They sort of wanted to drop Minakoyan's involvement. And in the correspondence, you see that Solomon Telirian stuck to the original of, of the work. We don't have the original, but he said we can, we, we've made it compact that we will tell a complete story. The editors wanted to take certain types of information out, the most important being Shahan Natali. Shahan Natali was actually the handler of the Operation Nemesis in Germany, but Shahan Natali had been kicked out of the, of the, of the Tash Taxation on disciplinary grounds and ideological grounds. When they tried to take his name out completely, Telegram argued, no, we have to, in fact, he says, we've already agreed that we will not leave anything out. This has to be a complete story. So they come to an agreement where Varazian, a high function ARF, took the name of Natalia, but the references are there. They also obscured some of the names of the operatives because they were still alive and they were liable for, 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 the, for, the, for, the, for the killing. And you can see through this backwards and forwards that Solomon Talian was committed to give the full account of what, what had happened. And the way the ARF had its own uh, position asserted was, was writing a new introduction. Uh, so it's around the book. So when we came to publish Talian's account, we left out all the front material and, and, and the additional materials at the back. We simply stuck to, to his, own, his own narrative. So the, the, the material in them, we, we're very lucky to have. It also shows that the ARF adopted this book as its, its way of saying we were responsible for Operation Nemesis. Until that point, it had not made a, a formal acknowledgement. Everyone knew, but there was no formal acknowledgement. The information that we have that the decision to carry out these killings of Turkish leaders, starting from Talat Pasha, was taken in 1919 by the party in Yerevan, was inserted into this book for the first time by Borazian, and Telirian allowed that to happen. So it's a very carefully crafted work, published by the ARF, uh, in order to tell its own story about Nemesis, while Telirian told his own story as, as a young operative who was recruited to do the actual killing. Why was he killed? Why was he t uh, recruited for this job? Because Solomon Telirian was motivated to carry out this task. 
because he was young, he was male, he was not married. That's exactly who you want to recruit to carry this type of operation. If, in fact, if you look at the other assassins of the Turkish leaders, they have a similar, similar profile. Often we use Stolom and Tendilya's work to discuss the Operation Nemesis. There are obvious limits. We only know what Solomon, Solomon's experience of Operation Nemesis was practical. How, would, how were the operatives working? How did they identify Talat Pasha? Very interesting. They didn't even know what he looked like because he had changed so much. And so it's, it, it reads like a spy novel, like a thriller. But the account is reliable. We also have Solomon Tellier's own prison notes. So when Solomon Tellier was sent to prison in Berlin, he kept, his, he kept a set of notes, about 50 pages, scribbled, very small. Well, we, we worked on that, the whole thing. Because it was written in prison, of course, he was careful what he said. He pretended to be a lone government. He couldn't betray his comrades because they were on the trail of other Turkish leaders, and of course, they assassinated him too. So he said he, he played the role of lone, role, uh, lone government, but in the prison notes, he gives some fascinating information. Um, he describes, in some ways, the killing of Talat Pasha, which in, in more um, lurid details, you know, as he walks by, he, he, he describes how his feet would drag themselves in his blood. I mean, he allows himself this kind of uh, description, but most of it is quite boring. But, but, but in the key moments, there's a moment where he realizes that he's actually going to be tried with a death penalty. And, he, and, and at one point, he believes that that's a real possibility. And, and his reaction is, I will send, take this mes avedis. I will go to the other world and tell the survivors that you know, the, the monster is dead. I mean, he, was taking, he stood by what he's done. He wasn't afraid. So we have this type of insight into, into his mental, uh, men, mental state. Um, we have an insight of when he was indicted, when he was first told that he was going to be um, tried for murder, and that there a, was a good chance of, of, he was, of him being convicted. Again, he's very calm about it. He just wanted to get through the, the trial. Um, there are, there are areas in which the, 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 the mirror does not talk, like what were his instructions if after the shooting, we're not entirely sure, because he actually tried to get away from it. According to others, he had to, you know, he had to stand still and, on the, on, and, and be arrested and go to court. These are sort of details that we can talk, but he doesn't deal, deal with it. He says, I ran away, and next thing I know, he, that they were beating me, they caught me, they were, they were beating me, and so on. It's a, again, it's, a, it's an insight of, Insight, insightful work, and we're lucky that there are other um, sources too. Perhaps the most important one is, is the German uh, police records, and there's one lady who's worked on it, uh, Osip uh, Moses. She talks about how, how the police saw, saw, saw Montel de Young, all kinds of insights, and that's why we know that this trial was politicized. Johann Lepsius, who was a major with this on his part at, at, his, at, his, uh, at his trial, was also working for the German Foreign Office. He was there in the interrogation, so there's a lot more to, to, to say about this work. It's not in here, because he's giving his own perspective. But this is additional information we have, and it all adds up to the credit of the, of the book. The book is the most complete account we have of the, of the assassination. And, um, and, in, and, and I could not find any point on the book which I could say I, well, I, can, I can falsify it. I think it was written in, in, in earnest, and it was Solomon Tendilian's final clear account of what had happened, because, people, because until that point, until 1953 when it was published, his account was still open to speculation from different quarters. Some people even question about the nature of the killing, whether the ARF was even capable of carrying out this, this type of killing. That's what Turkish nationalists say today. All kinds of theories that, oh, this was done by the British intelligence or the, or the Russians and so forth. So there was a need for this, this book to come out. And the, the Tashtar Sujun published it through Saper. It's a party document in many ways without compromising the truth of what Solomon Delhi had to say. So there's a, there's a happy medium there. And again, it, it reads like a spy novel, and that's to the credit of Mina Horia. That's what several people have said. Solomon Tadian was an ordinary guy, a decent guy. He wasn't a writer. This was written by a proper writer. And um, the success of the book, as uh, Asfadadurian uh, As As says, 
the success of the book was the fact that the substance of the book, but as well as the style of the book and the way it was written. So um, I normally will end my talk here, and we can talk about specific elements of, of, of Sorobo's um, experience as an eyewitness or of the actual killing itself, um, as well as what other people have said, and of course it invariably goes into discussion of Hadou Court or Operation Nemesis, on which it only gives the, the perspective of the government and how he carried out you know, the, the, the killing of Talat Pasha. Thank you.